January 1974, the full moon moved unusually close to the Earth. In search of has found that a strange wave of violent crimes seemed to affect many large cities. Moon madness has long been a persistent myth, which scientists are now investigating with computer technology. Can the full moon drive men mad? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. We have always feared the night and strange creatures that prowl by the light of the moon. Shakespeare said it best. It is the very error of the moon. She comes more near the earth than is her wont and drives men mad. The Latin word for moon is luna, which is the root for our word lunatic, meaning moonstruck. And we've tried to contain our fear of the moon's powers in old legends. Many of these myths tell of the moon changing men into animals. One story in particular seems to haunt the collective unconscious of all humanity. The story is so persistent, it must resonate with our basic biological drives. Found all over Europe, Asia, and among many American Indian tribes, the tale is best told in an old German nursery rhyme. My child, take heed, be pure at heart, and say your prayers by night, or you may become a cursed wolf when the moon is full and bright. Of course, there never was a recorded case of a human changing into a wolf. But thousands of tormented souls have been locked away in asylums, howling at the moon. This transformation from man to monster has been a favorite theme of storytellers. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In the classic film, John Barrymore was praised for his spare use of makeup and strong acting. In the novel, of course, the transformation was affected by a secret potion. But Stevenson's story was based on a true report of moon madness. In the 19th century, Edinburgh was plagued by a wave of senseless, brutal burglaries. Clues led police to suspect a single man was behind the crimes. But who could it be? The last person to suspect was William Brodie, a deacon of the Cabinet Makers Guild, a church elder, and stalwart community leader. Police hesitated to even bother this respected, hard-working man. They reminded him to be on the lookout at the next full moon. The unknown Edinburgh criminal seemed to favor those nights. William Brody was a classic case of multiple personality. In one body, two souls seemed to compete for dominance. The decent, hard-working artisan could normally maintain control except at nights of the full moon. Brody later said, it was not me. 
I insist it was not. There was another person in the room with me. The crime wave continued. A reward for the unknown predator was doubled, and only the foolish walked alone at night. Finally, acting on an anonymous tip, police staked out Brody's shop. At his trial, Deacon Brody was to base his defense on lunacy, blaming the full moon. The jury was not sympathetic. He was promptly hanged. Miami psychiatrist Arnold Lieber is author of the book, The Lunar Effect. His investigations into moon madness have stirred an ongoing scientific controversy. As a medical student, when I was doing my rotation on the psychiatric wards at the University of Miami Medical School, I noticed a rather interesting situation. I walked into the nursing station and said, hey, look what's going on out there. Uh, the natives are really restless tonight. Uh, what's happening? The nurses and attendants laughed and jokingly told me, well, it's time of full moon. They always go crazy when it's like this. It was at that point that I decided, hey, we ought to take a look at this. Maybe there's something to it, and maybe there's not. If there isn't anything to it, why don't we design a study that will prove that it's malarkey? If there is something to it, then we may meet, be able to make a valuable contribution to preventive psychiatry and criminology. So I set out to design such a study. The Dade County Medical Examiner's Office was Dr. Lieber's prime source of data. There, tens of thousands of murders had been meticulously cataloged and cross-referenced. What we did was to examine the murders in Dade County, Florida over a 15-year period in relation to the moon phase cycle. This study was the first time that adequate computer methodology using data samples over a long period of time and from different geographical areas were used in order to obtain our results. The strength of the peaks in our data were, qu were quite a surprise to us. What we found was a highly statistically significant increased frequency of murders, both at the full of the moon and the new of the moon in Dade County over a 15-year period. Miami was the first of several cities Dr. Lieber investigated. In each, he found evidence that violence waxed and waned with the moon. These peaks of violence at the full moon and again at new moon correspond to the times of highest tide. Could it be that some human beings go insane at high tide? Although everyone's affected by cosmic forces or geophysical forces to some extent, some people are in fact more susceptible to the triggering effects of these geophysical stresses than other people. I'm talking about emotionally unstable people, people in precarious balance with reality anyhow. These are people who are tiptoeing on the edge of reality, borderline personalities, manic depressives, uh, borderline schizophrenics, emotionally unstable individuals. These people seem to be uniquely susceptible to the triggering effects of geophysical or cosmic stresses. Anything may be enough to push them off. These people ought to know about this because there are certain ways that they can protect themselves from the effects. For example, if someone knows that they are uniquely triggered by the phases of the moon or by some sunspot activity, they may want to stay out of crowded places. They may want to avoid the bars. They may want to lock up their weapons at home. With this knowledge, police, fire rescue, and hospital emergency room people can prepare themselves for especially heavy loads during these times. They can lay on more people. They can expect heavier um, uh, heavier patient loads and they can be prepared and therefore be in a position to protect life and limb. Based on his theory of biological tides, Dr. Lieber suspected that January 1974 should be a period of extreme danger. He issued a warning to authorities. We're having an interesting coincidence of cosmic cycles coming up in about two weeks. There's going to be a full moon, a lunar perigee, and an eclipse. 
And this would be one of the times that we would predict an increase in the murder frequency and also in the, um, in the qualitative nature, uh, the bizarre type of sex-related murders that we've been having in the, the other two times that we pegged this. The first week in January, arson went on the upswing. Several cities reported a strange wave of fires and accidents. Emergency rooms were jammed, far beyond the usual Saturday night syndrome. By day, a mood of tension seemed to hang over the cities. The weather was hot and still. Reports began to come in from around the country. Orlando, two police patrolmen were slain on duty. Police switchboards reported an unusual number of calls. Then came the time of full moon. For police on patrol, it was a night to remember. A 45-year-old man stabbed his 25-year-old son to death after an argument over a car. Wichita, Kansas, four members of a family were shot in their home. Jackson Memorial Hospital, a medical resident was bound, beaten, and strangled. In Miami alone, the murder rate jumped to three times normal. A 57-year-old drifter was beaten with a board, and his throat was slashed. No apparent motive. For three weeks, violent outbreaks continued across the nation. This was more than enough proof for Dr. Lieber. He considered his theory valid. Certain extreme tides occur once every 2,000 years. The next is due in December 1990. Is there any defense against the madness that may strike again? Twice a day, the ocean rises and falls about four feet, pulled by the gravitational force of the moon. Many scientists think that life began down in the depths of the sea. Ancestors of these creatures were lured to the shore and stranded there at low tide. Most died. A handful evolved into amphibians, into animals, ultimately into us. Is it possible we can feel that time a billion years ago when we moved from the water up to the land and the air? Our bodies are still 75% water, the same salt water. If the vast ocean could be pulled toward the beckoning moon, could we also be at the mercy of her gravity? This theory of biotides has been received with skepticism by many scientists. Chief amongst them, George Abel, professor of astronomy at UCLA. The moon is the Earth's nearest astronomical neighbor. Its distance is only 30 times its own diameter. And it's because the moon is so near that it can have an important effect on producing tides. The moon pulls on the side of the Earth nearest it more strongly than it pulls on the side away from the moon. And that tries to stretch the Earth a bit into a football shape. The Earth actually distorts about eight inches. But I emphasize that tides are only important because they're acting over the entire 8,000-mile diameter of the Earth. It depends on the distance over which they act. A six-foot man is nothing in comparison. The moon can lower a man's weight by at most a hundredth of a gram, like a mosquito on his shoulder. And the effect of tides on the fluids of a person's body are 30 trillion times less than the weight of those same fluids. It's absolutely impossible that the biological tides can have any effect on human beings. Indeed, the tidal force exerted on me by this globe of the Earth is thousands of times stronger than the tides exerted on me by the moon. If tidal forces are too weak to influence human behavior, why then have we always felt the moon could affect us so strongly? For thousands of years, ancient peoples tried to solve that mystery. Many temples have been found to be computers in stone designed to predict lunar phases and eclipses. 
Is it possible we remember a time when the moon may have triggered another step in evolution, the emergence of the first humans? In small family groups, they roamed the belt, eking out a bare existence. It was a night of full moon, and they felt an instinct to take to the hunt. That moment is recreated here. They had moved down from the trees. They had given up grubbing for roots and were beginning to hunt other animals, rich in protein. With a hungry family waiting, the hunter knew this was no game. It was life or death. When the moon was full, he could see to track the skittish prey. In a way, at a crucial time in our past, we did turn into wolves. The women who waited found that they too seemed linked to the moon. While the men hunted, they closely watched the night sky to time their own fertility. They seemed to become fertile every 29 days, with the full moon. Legends grew that women were made pregnant not by men, but by the moon. In modern obstetrics wards, an old belief is shared by many women, the belief that more babies are born at full moon. Nurse Sherry Shaw. It's an old wives tale. And we definitely go along and tell the patients that it's an old wives tale only. But we really see a big influence when the moon is full. Patients just seem to come in. And it's not only here, it's seen in a lot of wards. Every place that I've worked, it's been the way it is. But it's been handed down through the years because my great-grandmother was a midwife and the story has perpetuated through our family clear back from her. I have been hearing for years that all kinds of strange things happen at full moon. And one of the things that's supposed to happen, according to legend, is that more babies are born at full moon. Well, this seemed a surprising thing to me, so a colleague of mine, a man at the medical center at UCLA Hospital, Dr. Bennett Greenspan, and I collaborated on a study of some 12,000 live births at the UCLA Hospital over a 51 lunar month period. Now, it would have been very exciting if we'd found some positive effect, but we found absolutely nothing, no effect whatsoever, absolutely random during the lunar cycle. Well, I must say this was quite a surprise to the nurses because the nurses were all certain we were going to find a very strong positive correlation. I think what happens is that if there's a busy night and the nurses look outside and notice a bright moon, and the moon is bright roughly a third of the time, then they say, aha, full moon, that's why we have all this activity. But if there's not a bright moon, they, they forget it. It may be a bit like dreams that come true. If a dream does come true, you remember it. But the vast majority of times where it doesn't, you tend to forget. What then of the flurries of violence and insanity reported at full moon, correlated by statistical studies? Among scientists, widely varying claims have been made. In any data sample, there are always a random fluctuations. For example, if you study homicides against the lunar cycle, you're going to get peaks at certain dates, always. And sometimes they may just happen to occur near full or new moon. But uh, that doesn't mean anything. One has to replicate such a result by many repeated experiments. In the case of Lieber's experiments, he found uh, peaks in one case at full and new moon, or near new moon. But he found slightly different peaks in a different sample and a larger peak at third quarter than at new moon. And other people who have tried to replicate these observations find uh, it impossible to do so. Alex Picorni at Baylor College, Texas, for example, has studied over 7,000 homicides and murders and suicides and finds no correlation whatsoever with phase of the moon or with the, even the distance of the moon. We examined aggravated assaults, suicides, failed traffic accidents, and psychiatric emergency room visits over long periods of time in Dade County. Each of these data samples likewise showed a distinct and statistically significant lunar periodicity. These results have been confirmed and extended by 16 other independent investigators since the appearance of our original paper in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1972. You know, 
I could predict that, say, two weeks from Tuesday, that all kinds of terrible things would happen. And I dare say that we could search through newspapers from around the world and easily confirm it. Obviously, this subject is highly controversial, and uh, in effect, we're dealing with a scientific hot potato. In this century, we began to dream of actually visiting the moon. A humorous film from 1902 by George Melier, based on the novel by Jules Verne, shows a spaceship shot from a giant cannon. Melier predicted that such a journey could have dire consequences, and he showed the moon as a demonic face. Melier's vision came true in 1968, when we visited our closest neighbor in space. For one brief moment, we learned to fly through the heavens like angels, leaving behind on Earth our violence, our irrational impulses, leaving behind stubborn territorial instincts we inherited from the apes. It's ironic. Those few times we walked on the surface of the moon, the legendary source of madness, were the times we became most sane. The Greeks and Romans worshiped Diana as the goddess of the moon. Beautiful, silvery, chaste Diana was the huntress. In the legends, however, Diana could change into Hecate, the goddess of witches, of evil, insanity, and terror. We have always feared that dark side of the moon. Perhaps we feel that we are really looking into the dark side of ourselves. <laughs> 